Hey guys, uh, welcome to 2022. Happy New Year. Um, I'm so excited for what God has for you and for me and for Grace Church. Um, it's a new year. It's a time we're looking back at 2021. Maybe your 2021 was incredibly difficult. Maybe it was great. But together we're looking forward and we're looking to God. And it was last year our pastoral team was praying about what God would have for Grace Church here in 2022. We really landed upon this real sense from God that God wanted us to read through the entire Bible together as a church in 2022 through the Own It 365 one story plan, like starting in Genesis in January, landing in Revelation in December. Not only that, but to teach through the Bible together, all of our 52 weekend services for both kids and adults, teaching through the Bible together, starting in January in Genesis, landing in Revelation in December, encouraging all of our groups and households to discuss the Bible uh, throughout the year and to put our focus on Jesus together. Why do we do this? We know that when you have Bible reading as a regular part of your life, it's part of your rhythm, you are a different person. God uses the Bible to transform your mind, to wash it, literally cleanse it, to put you in a state of God awareness. You're learning about Him. You grow in love and awareness of Jesus. Regular Bible reading is hugely important. We're building this entire year around supporting us on this journey. And so we're calling this year One God, One Savior, One Story. Because there is only one God. There's only one Savior. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, entered this world, lived the perfect life we never could, died under the cross and rose again. And there's one story. The Bible is the story of God. It's His story, one story. History is His story. And so to encourage you on this journey, I have some resources for you. Certainly we encourage every small group, every grace group, every study, every huddle to actually encourage you to read through the Bible together, discuss what we're reading in the days, what we're discussing on the weekends, several resources for you. All these resources are located on our website, visitgracechurch.com slash one story. So here are the resources. There's a reading plan available for you. The reading plan, absolutely free. There's a PDF on our website. You can get it for free also going to the Bible app. Just search for my name, Tim Howie, or own it 365, one story, you'll find the plan. There's a devotional book. Uh, I wrote that devotional book this past year. And, and by the way, all the proceeds for both the books I wrote with Grace Church, every dime goes to Grace Church, not a dime to me. And so this book is really like, imagine if you sat with me and read the Bible with me for a year, what that would be like. Hopefully that's a good thing. If it's a good thing, we're selling that book, the devotional book, both in hard copy and Kindle. There's a Let's Talk calendar. Uh, this thing is a 365 flip, spiral flip calendar my family's going to buy. We're going to throw it on our kitchen table. We did this several years ago. It's perfect for fostering spiritual conversations at our kitchen table, in our household. The Let's Talk calendar. Uh, there's also a kids podcast we're launching. And so our kids team, our Grace Kids team, making once a week a short podcast. That's perfect for unpacking the weekend story. Here's when you listen to it. On your commute, you're driving your kid to school, driving your kids to practice, listen to the podcast, have spiritual conversations in your car. There's also an Own It 365 podcast as well. I'll be doing that like once a month. We're targeting right now to kind of go deeper into some of the issues and topics that are brought up in our reading. Why are we doing this? You will be a different person. It's, it's really also why Bible reading on a consistent basis is so hard. The enemy attacks it. And so I have great... I think great advice for you, because here's the deal. You're going to miss days. You know, you miss one day, you miss a few days, you start late. I, here's my encouragement to you. If you miss Bible reading days, who cares? Who really cares? Forget the past. Treat each week like a brand new goal and just read that week's readings. Each week on our message notes, we're going to put that week's readings on our message notes. You can check it out. They're right there right now. Forget the past. If you miss days, who cares? No one's checking up on you. Let's make this ne next week a win. This next week is going to be Genesis 1 through Genesis 5 with some cross-references. Guys, I'm incredibly excited. We did this last time several years ago. It transformed our church spiritually. It transforms our kids, our students, our adults, our households. It'll transform you. I, I urge you, I beg you, join us on this journey. So this week, yeah, we're kicking off the year. One story, his story. We're in Genesis 1 and 2, if you want to join me in your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, this is the story of creation. This story helps us with the most important questions of life. Why exactly are we here? 
Why are you here? Why does the universe exist? What's the meaning of life? Guys, if your story is not just your story, many of us treat our story like just our story. But if our story is part of a larger narrative, his story, one story, we find our meaning in his story. We find great meaning and love and joy and peace in his story. I can't wait. I got to get started. So uh, would you join me in praying for our church, pray for our people that we all join this 52-week journey together? I'll lead us in prayer. Join me in praying. Lord, we pray for our church, all of Grace Church, everyone connected both online at our three in-person campuses, people around the world. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would move in people to join this journey with us, to take this journey to read the one story plan in their personal lives and hear about the one story, God, your story in the weekend services, kids and students talk about them in their groups, in their households and see themselves grow and be transformed. God, we lift all this up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are creator and Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to read Genesis 1 and 2, the creation account. Now, before we get into the creation account, this is the seven days creation. I want to share, share with you four different takes on what those seven days are. Uh, the seven days are, they could be, some people say literal 24-hour days, just like on earth, 24 hours like an earth day. Some people say it's literal, every day is literal, but it's, it could be a larger time period. You know, kind of like Venus, a day on Venus is eight months long. So they say maybe the day is a period of time that's a bit longer than that, but it's literal. Third group of people. Well, it's metaphorical. There's really no information beyond the fact that God was the origin of the creation story. And some people are like, it's mythological. It's fake. It's just made up anyway. Who really cares? You might be asking, hey, so Tim, where do you land? I thank you for asking that question. Uh, when I think about these hard Bible passages, passages that like, sometimes don't make sense to me, I think about what Jesus said to the Sadducees. So in Mark chapter 12, Jesus is in a series of debates right now in Mark 12, and the Sadducees come, and they don't believe in the afterlife. It makes no sense to them. Scientifically, there's no afterlife. You can't measure spirit. They think they have a question about people in the afterlife. They've got him caught. They bring this topic up to Jesus. Jesus responds. Here's the words. When I think about these hard Bible passages, the words of Jesus resonate in my mind. It's this. Mark chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. Jesus answered them as they questioned the afterlife. He said, well, you only have two problems. One is, you don't know the Bible. (laughs) You don't know what God actually said. You're misquoting God, and nobody likes being misquoted, especially you, especially me, especially God. You're misquoting God. Secondly, do you not believe God could do this? Do you have a, like suffer from tiny God syndrome, TGS? Like your teeny tiny God could not have an afterlife? And when I read the Christian story, like throughout the Bible, when, when stories are metaphorical or figurative, quite often God says, it's a metaphor, it's a figure, here's the example. So the challenge is when you jump, it'd be terrible to like jump into something that's actually literal and just call it figurative. And so I land in the literal camp. Now to be honest, yeah, I, I'd let, I, I say to my kids, this is what he's my kids. Could God not create in seven, seven 24-hour days? Of course he could. Why would you eliminate that? But could it be larger time periods? Like Venus has a day that's eight months long. It could be longer. I land in literal camp, not the metaphorical camp, no, certainly not the mythological camp. And so I think Jesus' words resonate with me. It's real info. I'm all, sometimes not sure how it's true, but I know God can do it. All right. Now let's get to the story. Finally, you're thinking. All right, so Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I can't wait to get there. Uh, And so I want to actually teach you a bit of how to read the Bible as we go on this journey this year. What I do when I read the Bible is I'm just aware of what pops off the page. That's often the Holy Spirit bringing things up to you. And this nature of the infinite Bible is every time you read it, something different pops up as the Holy Spirit's teaching you, revealing things to you. And so I want to encourage you to be aware. What jumps off the page for you? When you do your readings, make notes. Well, that jumps out. Here's a question I have. That's a wow factor. And you may think, I don't know anything I read but one word, forgiveness. Well, that was God's message to you. Apparently, God's dealing with you in forgiveness. So we're going to read all uh, parts of all seven days, all of day one, a verse from day two to five, 
some more of, a, of, of day six. We're going to walk through what jumps out to you. I'm going to come circle back and share the three things that jump out to me. Okay, let's read it. Genesis chapter one, day one, uh, verses one to five. This is connected with light. It says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. That's day one. We're going to talk about a verse of the next several days. How about a verse from day two where God created a space? Verse seven. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. How about a verse from day three now where God created plants? Verse 11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, on the earth, and it was so. Okay, now, day four, pluck up a verse from there, verse 16, about objects in outer space. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Which, by the way, is the greatest throwaway, throwaway line in history. <laughs> he made the stars also? We, we can see 6,000 stars with the naked eye. There are 200 billion trillion stars. Oh yeah, I made those also. Well, thank you, God. Let's continue on in day uh, into, into day, day five, no, day five, he starts creating animals in verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then a few verses from the sixth day. This is where we show up, humans. Uh, verse 26, we'll start, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, plural. That's the Trinity. We're seeing Father, Son, and Spirit creating people in His image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And some of you are out there like, I've wondered, now I know. I wonder when my ex was created. The creeping thing, day six. Let's keep going, verse 27. So God created them, uh, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And verse, down in verse 31, jump down to there. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right, jump down to verse, chapter 2, verse 1. We'll read three verses when God rested on day 7. He stopped working. Verse 1 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended the work, His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day, 
from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Okay, what jumped out to you? I guess how you read the Bible, and I'm reading the Bible, I'm like, things jump out, questions I write down, observations, aha moments, praises, things to do. Like, that's how you engage and grow in the Bible. So, I want to share three things that God had jumped out to me as I studied this passage. The third one I've been really thinking about, by the way, I, I think I forget often. I think it's not good. <laughs> I'm glad to be reading the Bible and reminded of this. So, Three things I want to share with you. The first one is, comes to the fact that, yes, this is a story of creation. Yes, you have day one through day seven. Yes, the universe is created, we're created. But, but it's like we're featured players. We're not the star. Like, we're also starring universe. It's clear when you read the story that God is the focus of the story. Specifically, God the Son. Jesus Christ is the focus of the story. It's His story. He's the one of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Son is the creator of the universe. It's His story. Like every verse, every action is framed in reference to God. Like when you scan through Genesis 1 to 2, you'll see phrases, God created, God said, God saw, God divided, God called, God made. God blessed. It's about what God has done. He's the star of the story. He's the focus. Genesis 1 to 2 also is incredibly helpful because it answers questions that a purely naturalistic view of the universe cannot answer. If you're a naturalist, if you don't believe in anything that's supernatural, you have some serious questions. Richard Dawkins, who's one of the most famous atheists and naturalistic evolutionary biologists, He's now 80 years old. I looked him up. And I actually, I prayed for his salvation. But pause and pray that Richard Dawkins has his eyes open to the God who created him and loved him. But even this atheist, evolutionary biologist, admits there are four things that naturalism cannot answer. Naturalism cannot explain origin, sexuality, morality, or consciousness. Like if you have a purely scientific, quote-unquote, naturalistic, evolutionary, bio biological view of the universe, you can't explain origin, but Genesis 1 and 2 says God had the start. In fact, science denied an origin of the universe until Einstein and Hubble, not until the 1900s, when science forced them to admit the universe had a beginning. Naturalism cannot explain sexuality. Why is there male and female? Genesis 1 and 2 answers it. It pleased God to make male and female. Science cannot explain, or evolutionary biology cannot explain morality or consciousness. But Genesis 1 to 2 can. We're created in the image of God. And if you want to go deeper into these questions, I will have a website and a book that can be helpful to you. The website's reasonablefaith.org. That's William Lane Craig's website. Great resource. Go type in your question. He's answered so many questions. There's also a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. You can go deeper in these topics. And by the way, I said Jesus is the creator. You want to see it? Too bad, you're going to see it. Look what he says in Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, as by Jesus, all things were created. He was the one saying, let there be light. In heaven that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him, through Jesus, and for him. Everything in the universe was created through Jesus. Everything, everything in the universe was created for Jesus, for his pleasure, for his glory. God, it reminds me also, John chapter 1, verse 3 repeats this. says, all things were made through him, through Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. What jumps out at me, first of all, when I read the Genesis account, is God himself is the focus of this story. And particularly, God the Son Focus of the story. It is one story from Genesis Revelation history. It is his story. It's about him. Okay, here's the second thing uh, that jumps out to me. Not only you see the focus of the story, but it comes from the opening words of Genesis 1. It's like every time I read this, I pause the first five words of Genesis 1, verse 1, which says, In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. Okay, so it says God didn't appear at the beginning. 
He was already here. Father, Son, and Spirit were already here. And there was no here. Where is here? There was no here. There was just Father, Son, and Spirit. And it was His action which launched time, which launched space. And it leads to this thought that God, here's my second thought, God existed before the universe. He existed forever before the universe. And this truth, I know this is true. I believe this is true. I can't wrap my mind <laughs> around what this even means. Before time, before space, before the beginning, there was just God. There was just Father, Son, and Spirit living forever, uncreated, until God created and time began and space began. And you might be asking the question at some point, well, what was God doing? He was doing something. And we actually find two things in Scripture that God was, at least two things He was doing. He was loving and He was planning. He was loving before there was a universe. He was enjoying life and love and joy in the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. That's John 17, verse 24. Listen to what Jesus prays when this relationship before time began. Jesus praying that he made you and me to be a part of that, see that, be part, and, like, embrace that ourselves. Look what it says in, in John 17, verse 24. Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. <laughs> Jesus prays, Father, remember when there was nothing? There was just us, Father, Son, and Spirit, and we loved each other. Father loves Son, Son loves Spirit, Spirit loves Father, love all around, and there was glory shared. And remember when we just loved each other? We just wanted people, we created people to share this. How amazing is that thought? That God created you to share it. He was loving. And this is incredible. God made you to be a part of this. Sometimes you wonder, what is the meaning of life? I can't find meaning of life. When you try to find meaning outside of the one who created you and had this love-filled relationship to one who invites you in, when you, find, you can't find meaning out of that. It'll leave you empty, a shell of a person. It's a good thing that you're not satisfied with other things out there. There's this longing inside you. God made you. He made you to take part in the love, witness His glory, be part of a family of God. That's what he was loving before there was a universe. He was also planning because he foresaw when he gave people choice in the garden, they would choose wrong. They would sin. We would sin. And God planned to send Jesus Christ into this world and die on a cross before time began. That's the phrase Revelation 13 verse 8. Revelation 13 8 calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Not only before time began, God was loving, Father, Son, and Spirit, and created us to take a part of His relationship, His joy, behold His glory, but He planned to come into this world and die as a sacrifice for us. Yeah, God existed before the beginning, before the universe. Okay, the third thing that jumped out at me, and this is a thing that I've been spinning on, and I've been realizing, I don't think about this enough. I forget this. This is not good. And that's what Bible reading does. Like parts of who God is, promises, character qualities, we forget. We're not reading the Bible like on a regular basis. And this, this thing that jumped out at me from Genesis 1 to 2, this third thing, comes from the seven times we read repeated. It was good. 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 And wow, it was very good. God was, it jumps out to me, God was creating things that were good, that brought him pleasure. In other words, God created the universe for his pleasure and his glory. God created the universe. God created you, created me for his pleasure and for his glory. So those phrases, okay, my favorite sport is basketball, my tragic great career in church basketball, cut short by not one, not two, three surgeries because of Great Church Basketball League. Thank you. But I, I picture these, it was good, it was good. I picture three-pointers like, it was good. Here's creation day one. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. It was, and then day seven, oh, oh, 
It was very good. I, I read, I'm like, God is creating things. He's like, wow, that is good. That is amazing. It pictures my goodness, my glory, its perfection. It is so, so good. God created the universe for his pleasure, his glory. It's clear throughout the scriptures. Revelation 4, verse 11, talking about Jesus. The praise in heaven is going on, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you, Jesus, created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. You might wonder what that will is. That will is his good pleasure. It's what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 says. Ephesians 1 is a great parallel to, to, uh, to the creation story and revelation. Ephesians 1, verse 9 says, Having made known to us the, might, the mystery of his will, according, here it comes, to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Yeah, God created the universe for his pleasure and his glory. That's why God created you. He didn't have to create you. He could have not created you, but you exist. You're a miracle. He brought you into this world for his pleasure, his glory. He had this love-filled relationship before time began. He has joy in you you have no, I have no idea about. It. See, that's the thing I forget. I sometimes think about my failures and mistakes and those kind of things and view God as, you know, disappointed. I've talked to others who feel like, and I don't feel continually disappointed, but others in our church who feel like they continually disappoint God. And yet God compares us to a father and children. And when my, my daughter, Malin, I, I, I do think our kids, if you're a parent, have no idea some of the good pleasure you get. And they're not doing anything profound. They're not accomplishing great things. It's not like my daughter accomplishes great things. I'm going to love her more, have more joy. It's not. There are moments that Malin is at home. She's in second grade. Happens all the time. She says something or she does something, and my wife and I'll make eye contact. And we got these huge smiles. And what she's done, honestly, doesn't matter long term. It'll be forgotten. But that moment of good pleasure, I'm reminded of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, that when you know Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus is in your, like, one with you. He lives in you with the Holy Spirit. When God looks at you, do you realize how much pleasure God has by seeing you one with Jesus, seeing the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's like the Trinity. You do things, and someone says, it's not going to matter long term. Who really cares? But I'm positive, like the, the Trinity makes eye contact <laughs> and smiles and says, that's me. That's my goodness. I drive pleasure from it. That's the thing I've been struck with. How easy it is for me to forget the good pleasure, the joy God has from just existing in relationship with Him without having to do anything profound or great just because He sees Himself in me. Like, do you view yourself that way? I think often we don't. Guys, yeah, when I read Genesis, what jumps out at me? God existed before the universe began. He was loving, had a relationship. He wanted to share glory. He wanted us to see and take part in before time and planned for his own sacrificial death, knowing we would sin all before time began. Then he created, let there be light, created everything. Why? For his good pleasure, for his glory. That's why we exist, for his pleasure. And the benefit, the bonus is we get joy in that moment, the shared joy and love and peace. And God is the focus of this story. He's the focus of this story, one story throughout scripture. He's the focus of history. It's his story. Is God the focus of your story? Is Jesus the focus of your story? See, 2022, what's the greatest thing you can do? It's the most important decision of life. 
Have you made this decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior? To place your faith in him as the one who came and died and rose again. What's it mean to make Jesus Lord? It means you surrender. You yield everything about you, everything you have, all your hopes and dreams, your future, you give as a gift. Like you're like a wise man <laughs> with Jesus at Christmas, bringing gifts to him. It's, it's all yours. What's it mean to receive Jesus as Savior? You admit you're a sinner. Oh yeah, you know the things you've done. And you admit there's no way you can ever atone for those things. So you place your faith in Jesus Christ who died and rose again. Have you made that decision? That life-transforming decision. Does the Holy Spirit live inside you? Are your sins forgiven? The greatest thing you could do right now is to pray, Dear Jesus, here in 2022, I receive Jesus, you as my Lord. I give you control of everything. I receive you as my Savior. I place my faith in you. Make me your child. Forgive me of sins. I want to be yours. That's the greatest decision you can make if you're not a believer. If you are a believer, I beg you, this year is about one God, one Savior, one story. This is only one out of 52 messages. It's, we're at 1 52nd, 1.8% into our story, the one story. I beg you to join us on the, on the, uh, on the website, visitgracechurch.com slash one story or on the message notes. You can see we're going to read Genesis 1 through 5 with key cross services. Join us on this journey. You will be transformed. God will transform you, wash you, cleanse you, bring your mind to a God awareness. You'll learn about him. You will love him more. Join us. Let's pray. Lord, God, I pray for our church once again. You would allow us, moving us to join this journey. And every day we forget or a week we forget or we don't read. Let us not beat ourselves up. Who really cares? Let's forget the past. Each week is a new week, a new goal. And just accomplish that weeks of reading. We pray this. Jesus, it's about you, your story, one story. In Jesus' name, amen.